because of that, the, the modeling that the health department is sharing with us shows that while we could have a peak of contagion uh, early next week, uh, based on their data, um, we should not expect to see that peak load on our hospital system uh, until early May, the beginning of May. And that's what we've been doing all this social distancing for, is to prepare for that event, um, to allow enough capacity within our healthcare system for everyone who needs the most severe medical treatment to be able to receive it. Now, the good news from my vantage point is that what we've just spent doing for the last four weeks as a city and as a metro area, it's working. Um, when you see the, the data that our health department is utilizing and the way they've updated their modeling for uh, right now versus where we were just a matter of weeks ago, we're talking about thousands of people's lives who are being saved by Tulsans taking social distancing seriously. And so uh, I cannot thank enough everyone in our community who has sacrificed so much uh, to protect the most vulnerable people in our community and to make sure that our neighbors have uh, the medical assistance that they need to get through this and for us as a community to be able to return uh, to our normal lives as quickly as we can. Um, with that said, uh, as we head into the, the peak contagion moment, which coincides with the holiday weekend, it is incumbent that all of us continue to do what we've been doing. We cannot let up now. We have to stay firm and vigilant in practicing social distancing as a community. And if we do that, we will keep this contagion rate lower. We will keep our death rate lower. And all of us will be responsible for saving thousands of lives in our city. And so I would ask everyone as you go into this weekend, and I know, uh, believe me, uh, how much we all want to be with our extended families and our friends on a holiday weekend. Um, what I would ask, though, is that we not think as much about uh, all the things that we can't do uh, over the next couple of weeks, but instead think about what we're a part of right now, every single one of us. We're part of one of the greatest humanitarian initiatives in the history of humankind right now. Uh, there are people all around the world who are sacrificing in the same way that we're sacrificing here to save their neighbors, just like we're trying to do here. If we ever needed a reminder of our common humanity, this is it. Uh, and so please think about that and how we are united with people all around the world. People we'll never meet, but we are united uh, as human beings in this effort to save our fellow uh, people, our fellow citizens, uh, our, our, to save mankind. Um, I, I also uh, want to bring up just a couple uh, updates. Uh, we have had over 800 individuals contact TulsaResponse.org uh, to seek uh, no interest, zero interest, uh, loans for their businesses or their nonprofits. Uh, we have this in place uh, to tide people over until the federal funding, which is far more substantial than anything we could afford locally, uh, hits the streets here in Tulsa. Uh, if you're a business owner, and I just had a business owner reach out to me this morning and they hadn't heard about it. If you're a business owner and you need uh, that kind of assistance to tide you over to get one of those small business administration loans, please go to TulsaResponse.org. And uh, not only do we have uh, zero interest loans that are being funded by the city of Tulsa through that, but we also have uh, navigators, individuals who can help you uh, through this process of identifying other funds that are out there, whether that's through the state or federal agencies. Uh, or other uh, businesses that are out there. So 
Uh, I strongly encourage any business who hasn't already reached out to TulsaResponse.org that needs that kind of assistance to please do so. There's, it's about so much more than uh, the zero interest loans. There, there's comprehensive assistance there for you to navigate, which, which can be a, a very complicated field out there. Uh, we're very grateful at the city of Tulsa uh, that we received uh, this week an allocation of protective equipment for our first responders from the national stockpile is allocated to us by uh, the state government. And that will give our uh, police officers, our firefighters, our emergency medical responders, the protective equipment they need. And so they don't have to hesitate at all. Uh, and they haven't been anyway, but at least now we know that they'll be protected when they're going to respond to an emergency. They don't need to have that concern about whether or not the, the person that they're helping uh, has coronavirus. So we're very grateful for that allocation of protective equipment. Uh, we, we need more in the long run, and our team at the City of Tulsa is working with Tulsa Area Emergency Management Agency on that. Uh, but it's good news in the near term for us uh, that we have that protective equipment for our first responders. Another group that uh, I don't think we do a good enough job thanking in this environment is our trash haulers. Uh, we, we found that as of yesterday, uh, our recycling tonnage at our at residences during this event is up 18%. Uh, our refuse tonnage is up 16%. Um, and so our, our trash haulers, our recycling haulers, they're processing so much more uh, every week than is normal uh, under normal circumstances because we have so many more people home. Uh, and so I want to thank them. And I also want to encourage all my fellow Tulsans, if you're sick, uh, please double bag uh, your trash and put it in the gray bin uh, so that we can protect the health uh, of our haulers. Um, one last thing I want to remind people of, and this is important at a time like this, when we're talking about receiving uh, small business administration assistance from the federal government, when we're trying to get allocations of protective equipment uh, from the federal government's national stockpile, um, we get all of those things based on our census count here in Tulsa. And right now, everyone in our community should have received in the mail uh, your census notice to complete. Uh, I did it online in the midst of responding to all this, and it took me 10 minutes to do for a family of four. Uh, it's very quick, and completing that is so important to have an accurate uh, population count for us in Tulsa. Uh, and so I, I, I encourage everyone uh, to please take a few minutes, if you haven't already, to fill that out, uh, and let's have a, a good count for Tulsa because there are – hundreds of millions of dollars uh, at stake in how good of a count we have uh, on, on the census. Um, uh, lastly, I, I just wanna wish everybody in our community uh, a safe holiday weekend. Uh, and I, again, I, I wanna thank you for what you're doing. It, it is very important when we see the data whether that's uh, on the online mobility data that, that's available out there that shows how we're doing compared with other cities, uh, or when you hear the updates from the health department, to know that Tulsans are making these sacrifices to uh, stay at home and stay safe and minimize uh, our exposure to other people. We are slowing the spread of this virus and we are saving lives, and I cannot thank you all enough. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague from Tulsa County, Karen Keith. Thank you, Mayor. Stand by while we bring Karen Keith on board. We would like to introduce Karen Keith with Tulsa County. Right. Mayor, thank you. And Bruce Dart, you two have done a remarkable job. And I just want to thank you and hope that you take some time and enjoy your families this weekend. So some updates. Uh, the Board of County Commissioners is going to meet on Monday. We need to do an extension. Uh, it's on our agenda to keep restrictions in place so that we can keep the number of people coming and going from the courthouse to a minimum. I'm happy to report that Sheriff Regalado says the jail continues to have no cases of COVID-19 among the inmates. 
two inmates who had symptoms. Fortunately, those tests came back negative. So, so far, all these measures that the sheriff and his team have implemented to protect the jail are working. And the population is at 974 this morning. That's down from normally it's 1,200 to 1,300 on average from just a few weeks ago. The expedited docket has been a big help in keeping those numbers down. And our court clerk continues to do all the back of house functions to keep the wheels on our justice system. And while the courtrooms are empty, this work has to go on. Some 39 criminal charges on average are being filed every day. And the Tulsa County Election Board and the Oklahoma State Election Board are asking voters to register absentee in an effort to keep the numbers down at polling stations in the future. Visit the Election Board website for information to help you request an absentee ballot. Now, if you don't have access to an electronic device to uh, fill out your online application, you can obtain a hard copy from the Tulsa County Election Board on Denver, but please call ahead. And then kudos to the Tulsa County Election Board for their efforts to protect candidates filing for office this week. They made it so easy and safe. They did a drive up filing. So it was really creative. So thank you guys. And if you're looking for a way to help those in need while staying home, you can donate online. I've mentioned this before to the Tulsa area COVID-19 response fund that's set up through the Tulsa Community Foundation and the Tulsa Area United Way. You can pull up either website and make a donation. Those funds support the local agencies who help everybody who is in need right now with whether it's temporary unemployment, lost income or unexpected food and childcare expenses. And then I love this one, the restaurant employee fund set up by the Lobeck Taylor Foundation has already cut checks for some 235 individuals at $1,000 a piece. One Oak generously gave $75,000 to the fund and you can help out in any amount. And this goes directly to the members of our community who need it most and it's really, really easy. Just go to the Mother Road Market website, pull it up and figure out what you wanna do as a donation uh, and they'll make, they'll make it happen. And then the Family Center for Juvenile Justice, they have reduced their population to 12 young people. And this week with the help of Tulsa Area Emergency Management Agency, they gave us some additional masks and sanitizer. But like everyone else, they are scouring the internet to find these much needed items. And in addition, I love this story, presiding juvenile judge Martha Rupp Carter has been making masks for essential staff that continue to work every day. And then I wanna thank a group of quilters at Tulsa County led by Thora Cohey. They are making additional masks for the juvenile center. They volunteered and stepped up. So I really wanna thank you. And I wanna remind you again that if you believe you have the coronavirus, call this number, it's 582-9355. Again, it's 918-582-9355 a phone screening. And finally, I wanna give a shout out to our two state schools. OSU Medicine for their quick response, ramping up testing for the state by doing some 1200 tests a day with a 24 to 48 hour turnaround. And they set up 40 different testing sites throughout Oklahoma. And then OU Medicine is taking part in a therapeutic trial in Oklahoma City. They're encouraging COVID patients who tested positive to donate plasma as soon as possible. And this will allow them to do plasma infusions in the most serious cases. Now, in closing this holiday weekend, it is all about hope. And I love the inspiring words of Bruce and our mayor. You know, it is so refreshing as we walk our neighborhood to meet so many faces we've never seen before. And then we've got these neighbors who, their children have been putting up art in, in their windows and they've been so others have picked up on that and so as all of us pass those windows it just gives us joy so this is a weekend of hope but in order to continue staying safe we can't we just can't stop doing our social distancing so please continue what the mayor and bruce start have asked and let's stay home enjoy the holiday weekend with our family and make the best of it we'll see you soon Thank you, Commissioner Keith. Please stand by as we bring our speakers back on.
We'll now be taking questions from the media. Our first question is for Dr. Dart from KJRH. Vice President Mike Pence yesterday uh, said federal support for community-based coronavirus testing sites across the United States will end today. How will that impact Oklahomans? You know, frankly, I'm not sure that that, that it will. I mean, we, we continue to get and work very hard to get the supplies that we need to ensure that, that those who need a test can get a test. And that's not going to stop. So whatever it is that we need to do to get this job done to serve our communities, we're going to do it. And you've seen from, from the leaders who spoke today that there's nothing that's going to stop us from moving forward and ensuring that we've got that the materials we need to protect all Tulsa and Tulsa County residents. Okay, from CMG Tulsa for Dr. Dart. We saw peaks and valleys in the, in the statistics from Italy. Do we anticipate a similar, similar pattern here? You know, our, our pattern really hasn't matched the pattern that, that's been shown in Italy. And, and I think um, we've got evidence that Tulsans continue to social distance and they've been doing the right thing as, as they've been asked to do. And so I think the only change we're looking for is, is the flattening of the curve. If, if everyone continues to step up and, and embrace their responsibility to stay apart. Okay, from Fox 23, Dr. Dart, are people still going to get sick after we peak? Does that mean we could see an escalation in cases when the projected peak passes because people think we're in the clear? You know, and frankly, just really too early to answer that question. I think that's always a possibility. This virus, we're still learning how it functions and, and the disease pathology behind this virus. So we are, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why we're, we're trying to project so accurately so that we do get the right information out, knowing, and we've always been very honest about, about the information changes rapidly. So. We'll continue to to look at our data and use our, our modeling um, analytics to tell us the story that we need to tell the public. And when it changes, we, the first thing that, that we'll tell is all of you. Okay, Dr. Dart, are deaths attributed to COVID-19 confirmed through testing, why or why not? And does Tulsa County have enough available ICU beds and ventilators to meet the need for the number of cases that could be coming at the peak? What is the number of ICU beds and ventilators that are currently being used and what's available? So let me say that that um, when we, when anyone that, that has COVID has, has passed away, we, we attribute that death to COVID regardless of underlying health conditions because it was the, the COVID that was the final thing that we think put, um, put people in that position. You know, the, we've been looking at, at the data, hospitals have been very, good about sharing what, what their uh, resources are and we feel that, that at this juncture if we continue to to social distance um, people that do become ill we do have the capacity in our hospitals to deal with that and to treat them and treat them uh, um, treat them accordingly so um, that's why it's important that we, we not get I think too comfortable and not get um, compliant that that if we if we stop social uh, social distancing too soon, that then we do have to have really serious conversations about how our hospital system could be overwhelmed. So it's important to, I think, embrace the message, to stay on, on task with that message so that the hospitals can do what they do and we can keep all of our, all of our citizens safe. Okay, from Fox 23, Dr. Dart, are the Tulsa County hospitalizations also showing a flattening over the last 10 days? As Governor Stitt said, we are statewide. You know, I mean, there's a little bit lag in this data, so we're not seeing that flattening here yet. We hope that that, that more that, that people continue to social distance, we'll start to see those numbers. It's too early to say that here in Tulsa it's just yet, though. Okay, from Channel 6, Dr. Dart, can you clarify the 176,000 projection, and is that for the state? No, that's cumulative for um, Tulsa County from um, thinking that, that this is probably in our community in um, in, in February early on that, that we weren't testing. So we're looking at that cumulative total from now through August of, of everybody in Tulsa County. Okay, Tulsa World for Mayor Byam. Given limited, given limited in the state testing, how are policies decisions informed for the COVID-19 response? Oh, he's muted. Trying to answer it as best I can. I guess this is the challenge of doing this 
uh, remotely. Um, we we have not had enough testing, uh, adequate testing. We do not have uh, enough testing, uh, and I don't think any city in America has uh, enough testing. Um, that that's the challenge of, and that's not the fault of somebody, uh, which seems to be the game that gets played. Um, it's a matter of this being a new virus and developing enough testing kits uh, and the reagent that's necessary for those kits to be effective on a scale for a new virus that no one in our entire country was immune to when it hit the United States. And so the, the challenge that we've had here in Tulsa to date in making decisions uh, and that we certainly faced in the early stages was that we didn't know how widespread it was, um, and, and we still don't. Uh, but what we can do, uh, I think, and, and where we, I think, are, are in a better position than a lot of cities in the country, is that being in the center of the country, uh, contrary to the name of it, not having an international airport, um, we weren't hit by this as quickly as the coastal cities in the United States were. Uh, and so we were able to look at what those cities dealt with, uh, how they handled it, how they reacted. And we got a, a couple weeks advance on in the life cycle of this virus compared to what coastal cities in the United States had available to them. And that allowed us, I believe, to respond and put in place social distancing practices here and in Oklahoma City and that metro area as well, much earlier in the progression of this virus than you saw in coastal cities in the United States. And that's simply because we had the ability to see what they were going through. That's not something that they got to benefit from. So we owe, a, I think, a great debt to the sacrifices made by people in cities in the coastal United States because we were able to learn from what they were doing and respond accordingly and put in social distancing practices earlier on in the life cycle of this virus in our community than they had the ability to do. I think that's why you don't see, at least so far, as widespread an impact in Tulsa as you might in some of those coastal uh, cities in the country. And again, all of that is fine to date, but if we don't continue doing what we've been doing, uh, especially going into maybe the most critical part of this entire life cycle of this virus in our community, uh, then everything we've done to date will be for naught. And so maintaining, as Dr. Dart said, that vigilance uh, over the next several weeks is so important. Okay, from Fox 23. And my, my hope, by the way, on the testing side of things uh, is that we will continue to see increased testing capacity. My hope, I mean, th there's tremendous incentive on the private sector side to establish broader testing so that anybody can go to a drugstore and get it. Uh, and my hope is that we'll be in a place here sooner rather than later where that's possible. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, everyone in our community can have the level of confidence that they need uh, until we get to that place. Okay, from Fox 23 for the mayor. How strict are police going to be this week on churches for Easter Sunday? We've seen many churches doing parking lot services and more and more people are showing up to them. Some of them are even getting out of their cars and praying in groups now. Well, uh, that's a terrible idea. Um, I, I don't see how uh, putting your fellow congregants at the risk of getting a virus uh, is a great way of showing love and faith. Uh, so I would not recommend that to anybody, nor, by the way, have I talked to any pastor that recommends that. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with pastors over the last several weeks, uh, and I want to say I, I cannot think of any of them who haven't followed the advice that we've given them. Uh, all of them have been really great to work with. They want to protect the people uh, in their uh, religious institutions. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, we, we've said from the beginning, and we'll continue to say, that churches uh, should, as under the governor's order, should be practicing remote services. Um, uh, and 
people should be practicing social distancing uh, when they are uh, putting on those remote services. Uh, if people are all sitting in cars uh, in a parking lot watching uh, a, a service broadcast over a radio station, as we've had a couple churches do, I think that's a fairly low risk uh, event. So long as people are smart enough to stay in their cars and not get out, uh, if they get out, then it's ruined it for everyone that came to that service. Um, but as I've said from the beginning, uh, we were very clear uh, on what people ought to do. The state has been very clear on what people ought to do, uh, but we're not. The, the Tulsa, this is a case where we're clear on what we're going to, what people ought to do. The Tulsa Police Department is not going to be out uh, arresting uh, pastors for conducting a, a service where people are all staying in their cars in a parking lot. Um, there are enough high risk issues that continue to go on in our community, which the Tulsa Police Department has been dealing with uh, that we're going to keep our focus on those. Okay, from Channel 8. Mayor, we've heard talk from small businesses that eventually reopening to a, they will be eventually reopening to a mountain of debt. For some, it may be easier to just declare bankruptcy and start over, but that could really hurt the Tulsa community. Can you talk about what's being done to specifically help them and how realistic it is that businesses may be open by May 1st? Um, well, a uh, couple thoughts on that. First, uh, we've put in place uh, this zero interest loan program for people to be able to utilize to tide yourselves over, your businesses over until uh, the federal funding comes to Tulsa. And this is um, a, a massive funding program that has been established uh, solely to help businesses get through this period of time uh, and emerge on the other side of this and, and be able to recover over time and get back to business as usual. Um, but we recognize there's a bit of a lag time between today and when that funding, when the actual dollars get through the pipeline here to Tulsa. And that's why we've put that program in place. But I'm also very grateful for our congressional delegation's leadership in putting that federal program in place that will assist people. Now, I think the larger question is, when can we get back to business as usual? And the, the, the honest answer on that is that we can get back, we can start flipping uh, the switch to go back to where we were before we started putting all these restrictions in place. Uh, I imagine it will be in a phased process. Um, it won't all be at once, uh, but it will be with the health department. The guidance the health department's given us on this is that it's measuring the number, the load you expect on our healthcare system for people who have contracted this virus. Uh, and once we get to a point where we believe that moving forward, we've passed that peak and that healthcare system can handle moving forward the number of people that get the virus and need hospitalization, then we can start to phase back uh, to normal uh, life as we used to know it. Um, but that is not something that somebody can just tell you, oh, in three weeks, that'll be it. That's something that we will, we're will we visiting day to day with the Tulsa Health Department on. Uh, that's why I also think it's incredibly important that people pay attention to these two peaks that we're talking about. There's the infection peak, but then there is the hospitalization daily peak, which we expect in early May. Um, and so I think that latter point is the most important for us as far as monitoring the health uh, of our hospital system and being able to make sure that everybody who needs uh, to get uh, hospital care can get it. The, the, the last thing I would say on this is uh, that it's very important for people to understand that, you know, we don't expect coronavirus to just go away um, in mid-May. Uh, no one in Tulsa, except those who've already had it, are immune to it. Uh, it will be here for a long time. Um, the challenge for us is not, uh, you know, thinking that come mid-May or June that just everybody is free and nobody will ever get it again. 
it's having a pipeline in our healthcare system that can manage the flow of people who need hospitalization after contracting this virus. And, and what we know is, again, when you have an entire community that's not immune to it, we've said this from the beginning, when we talk about flattening the curve, what you're wanting to do is spread that flow through your hospital system over a longer period of time, instead of getting a giant spike all at once early on, because a bunch of people contract it all at once and suddenly your hospital system can't handle it. So we're trying to spread that out over a longer period of time. Uh, and I wanna set expectations appropriately there um, when it comes to what we can expect over in the months ahead. Uh, but for right now, our orders, same as the federal government, same as the states are in place through April 30th. Uh, and we'll get through this month and, and visit with the health department on where they think uh, we are in the life cycle of that virus in our community. And, and then we'll revisit uh, at that point uh, how far we think we need to continue these various social distancing practices. And remember, we implemented these in phases. I would expect us to start to dial them down in phases, but all of that will be done in concert with the Tulsa Health Department recognizing what needs to be done to keep people safe and alive. Okay, channel six for Dr. Dart. Do you recommend COVID antibody testing? If so, why? And are there antibody tests available here? You know, eventually we, we really wanna see if we can expand antibody testing. And really it, it gives us an idea of, of the, the penetration of COVID-19 in our community. It also helps us, helps inform us on our vaccine strategy uh, when that is 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 ready to to begin, when vaccines available in, in 12, 18 months, as the um, feds keep telling us, and um, we're actually trying to get now uh, assess who who might be doing antibody testing in Tulsa and Tulsa County, so that we can make that information available to people who want to get a test. We are at the Health Bar are not doing it yet. Um, eventually, I'd, I'd like to see us doing both, but that we're not at that juncture. Okay, Fox 23 to Commissioner Keith. Um, does the county plan to open its popular Chandler Park splash pad on time for Memorial Day weekend? Uh, just like everybody said, we're going to reassess um, as everything goes along. So I would I don't know the answer to that, but we are just going to have to look at all the numbers and see where we are. Uh, we won't open it if it's not safe to open it. We we want to make sure the citizens. Uh, and our children, especially, are, are safe from this virus. So we'll we'll be reevaluating. Okay, Channel Eight for Dr. Dart. Tulsa's hospitals draw in people from all over the region. Do we have any? Uh, we have an idea on how many people are having to be transported here for care, and are we prepared for more people from rural counties coming to Tulsa? So that, that is data that is kept by our regional medical response system. They monitor that. They monitor who's being transported and transferred. So we have that information. Um, and that's that information is fed into the models used for hospitals and their surge capacity um, modeling. So we think at this juncture that that is not going to be a concern. Of course, we don't know how um, if, if the virus is going you know, to pay attention to our models and do what, what, we're, we're, what we're predicting it to do. So that's why we continue to, to do this work and, and do the modeling so that, that we've got the right answers for these kind of questions for our, our healthcare system and healthcare providers. From Fox 23 for the mayor, there have been pictures posted across the country of cities having issues with their plumbing and sewer lines being clogged by people throwing away things like disinfecting wipes and other cleaning products that shouldn't be flushed. Has Tulsa seen this problem yet? Is this an expensive problem to fix? Well, it is an expensive problem to fix. I will say, though, that this is an area where, again, Tulsans are handling this uh, I, I think in an exemplary way, actually visited with the director of our water and sewer department yesterday, and he was super excited because we'd gone four days without a water line break. Um, it, it's another reminder that uh, we have our crews at the city of Tulsa that are continuing to work through this, and especially in our water and sewer department, that are out there doing just incredible work. Um, and they, we've not seen a, a real a, an unusual surge in people 
uh, flushing things uh, down the toilet or, or otherwise, but we certainly encourage you uh, to keep in mind that you shouldn't be doing that. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we have an outstanding uh, residential uh, waste and recycling program here that's right there outside your home for your use to throw all that stuff away and you, you don't need to try and flush it uh, and end up clogging up uh, your pipes or, or the cities. But so far we haven't had anything unusual, uh, thankfully. Okay, our last question is for Commissioner Keith. Um, Fox 23 was wanting to know if uh, there has been people that have been applying for marriage license and uh, currently. Yes, um, they've had quite a few people even come in from out of county. Um, we had one couple come in yesterday and they were, she had been out of the country and she needed one more day. So they actually went outside of the courthouse to help them do their paperwork and, and and get it done for them. But um, they'll have some, I think about 30 a day or something like that. There've been, or 30 this week, but they are coming in. Uh, but there's, you know, the, you, they do ask you to call in ahead of time on those. There's a lot of paperwork to be filled out. So don't just show up thinking you're going to be able to do all of that. So call up in advance follow all the instructions that they have for you and then uh, they will help you. They've done a remarkable job of, you know, keeping things working. And that's true of all the uh, different divisions at Tulsa County. People are still doing their jobs. Most of the folks who are over 60 are not coming in. Uh, a lot of them are working remotely, uh, but most of the county functions are still absolutely ongoing. Okay, thank you guys so much. This will thank conclude you. our press conference. Have a good weekend.